fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Sitting uh, sideline today, we've got Mr. John Copenhaver. How are you doing? I'm splendid, Al. How are you? Splendid. <laughs> Splenda. <laughs> Not Splenda, Splendid. Splendid. I'm good. I'm good. That was a little sarcastic. I was yeah, yeah. No, it's not like you. Here in Richmond, it's gross. It feels like my skin hurts when I just walk to the car. It's just, it needs to stop. Well, you got to watch who you're touching. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just touching the air. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. Well, you know, it's hot here too, but the good thing is it's all dry. It's dry heat. Uh, where I am. So, dry heat. yeah, you get all that humid stuff. So, well, after the uh, outright DC, uh, everything's good, right? You're all yeah. relaxed now. We so, were all actually uh, uh, welcome to Kelly. We were we were all part of DC outright this weekend, which was very cool. And uh, yeah. It's good. Yeah. I was yeah. in the middle of a book signing and I left to do it. You did. That was impressive. <laughs> yeah, it was impressive because I had people waiting. <laughs> <laughs> they actually waited an hour for me. Oh, wow. I know. I know. That's pretty but, impressive. Yeah, no, it was good. It was actually a really good turnout, too. All, all four days um, sold lots of books. was pretty impressed. Wow. You know? That's great. Awesome. Yeah. Good. I don't know why that happened, but well, now we've got uh, a guest, another guest who was on one of your panels. Um, now, uh, her book is called Real Bad Things, and it's Kelly J. Ford. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's really great to be here with both of you. So I have to say, um, this is, uh, is this your second book? It is, Correct. First yeah. book was Cottonmouth. Cottonmouth, which is, you got quite a few good reviews for it. Yeah, Cottonmouth was awesome. What, what, oh, what, you, what brought you into this uh, world of writing? Like, what, what was it that happened to you that made you decide to actually start writing a book and publishing it? Oh, gosh. It, a long time, just lots of time writing things down. I mainly started writing poetry when I was in junior high. My best friend and I, Angie Clark, we would just be in our bedrooms writing constantly. So I feel like writing was just the thing that I always did. I didn't really have career plans with it. So I dabbled in so many things. I was doing poetry. And then for a while, I I was thinking about screenplays and Eventually, I decided to try flash fiction and then short stories and eventually just made my way into a novel in progress class at Grub Street Writing Center in Boston. And that was where it really struck me that, oh, I guess I can do this Um, because I had a full length book that I had been working on for a long time. It started out really as a screenplay, but I just kept I couldn't let it go. And it was just one of those things that I worked on on the weekends, truly, when I had nothing better to do. So I didn't actually set out with any true intention of becoming an author. I was definitely not one of those people who always wanted to be one. I just happened to always be writing. And then I was surrounded by other people who were publishing things. And so then it became a oh, hey, I want to do that too. You guys are cool. So (laughs) it was pretty accidental, but um, really wonderful in the end, obviously. 
how do you how do you create your stories um when you're putting together these these books is it kind of um do you have a thought or theme or some sort of event and you center mm-hmm. it around that or do you build off of a character that you think of like where where does it begin it's kind of all of the above I, I joke that I kind of start all of my books with vibes. <laughs> so um, talking about real bad things, it was basically a mixture of many things. But the two things that really stood out to me is my dad. He's my favorite storyteller. And he he tells really weird stories. Um, and he he and my aunt, it's like how many ways you can die in Arkansas, you know? So <laughs> I always like, I just grew up with that death and weird shit was just a part of growing up. My family would sit around a fire and tell all these gruesome stories. And we were kids and we just ate it up. We loved it. And um, so I just remember at one point, my dad was talking about you know, he'll just send me a text saying they found a dead body at the bottoms or at the lock and dam. So <laughs> the lock and dam features very heavily in real bad things. And um, another piece was just I, I had a a terrible stepdad. And honestly, it was like, you know, I wouldn't mind if that dude died. <laughs> you know, I was I was in junior high and I hated him and um yeah, so I guess in a little way it's wish fulfillment, but um, yeah, that was kind of a piece of it all. And in terms of characters, I had two two manuscript that I didn't necessarily abandon, but the stories weren't quite there. Not a lot was going on, and so when I was building this story based on those kind of ideas kicking around in my head, I had a teenage character from one of those abandoned manuscripts and I aged her up because I just really loved her character so much. And she became the character of Georgia Lee. Like I could just truly picture her as an adult based on what I'd written of her as a teenager in the old manuscript. And then I had the other lead character for Real Bad Things, Jane Mooney, she came out of a totally different novel that I had set in Boston where I was living at the time. And she fit so perfectly with Georgia Lee. And so I kind of mashed those things together because I I truly don't throw out anything. I, I will, if I really love a character or a setting or a situation, they, they stay in my head and I I can't r- get rid of them and so I just think about how I can use them in different ways or in different books I can't help but think that um, when you talk about your father and stepfather and mm-hmm. and the stories that a lot of what you write um, it, it, it is centered in personal stuff personal feelings or oh, thoughts oh, definitely and so when you but when mm-hmm. you do that and you actually publish it rather than just write it in a diary or somewhere where you're at home and it's just you or your best friend seeing it. But when you actually put it out for the world to see, does it, does it sort of make you feel a little bit vulnerable? With, with friends and family, definitely. I don't mind at all the general public, what, what they, their perception might be in terms of me or my story, you know, that I can take, I can take a bad review. Um, But with friends and family, it's definitely like, please buy it, but don't ever tell me anything else about it ever again. (laughs) You know, like, I I don't want to know. And of course, I have heard things, but, um, you know, my dad wasn't able to read Cotton Mouse because um, his eyes aren't, good enough for that small type and I didn't have an audio book so I kind of got away with that one but um my brother and my sister-in-law they're both still in Arkansas and um you know it was it was really wonderful to hear their feedback and my sister-in-law was actually one of my my beta readers for real bad things and it was just an incredible moment to get her feedback and hear that she was like, this is Arkansas. This is what it's like. And this is one of my favorite characters ever. And so that was, that was really cool. So, so yeah, I mean, it is vulnerable, but it's also, 
I think it would be more vulnerable if I were telling, you know, family secrets. Like I would never, ever write a memoir. Like I just couldn't. Um, and I, God bless the people who do, but I, that's just not my forte. And I, I'm too sensitive to hurting other people's feelings, even though I do that a lot anyway, <laughs> without <laughs> meaning to. So. Mm, story yeah. of my life. No. Yeah. That's so interesting, Kelly. I, I um, have a good friend who has written a memoir and always kind of wants me to do that. And I have the same mm -hmm. reaction um, that you, you do. I just, I, I can't imagine dealing with the fallout of mm -hmm. doing that. Um, uh, but, but my question for you actually is, um, you live in Vermont, but you mm -hmm. have your, your books have such a strong sense of place, um, you know, like located in the South, Arkansas. Do you feel like you needed to get away to write that, to have perspective on it? Or is is that just sort of, you know, is that, you think that was the central part of the pro? I, I've heard other writers say that. That's why I'm bringing it up. Do you think that was a central part of the process or, or not? I think so. I don't. I mean, I would not be the person I am today if I had stayed in Arkansas. Um, most of my friends and some family joke that me and my brother, you know, we should be dead in a ditch barefoot in Arkansas, <laughs> you know, based on a lot of what we experienced growing up. So that distance geographical and, you know, time has been very important for me but it's also Arkansas is a place where I came of age um I didn't leave until after college so I was you know all the big moments were truly in Arkansas for me um so it's it's a love-hate relationship but I think because I'm away I can have more of that love come through while also critiquing a lot of the things that are not great about Arkansas um but yeah, it's definitely one of those things, like you had mentioned, John, it's, I think why it's easier for me and it's, it's healthier perhaps for me to filter my lived experience through fiction. So I don't have to pinpoint specific people or things or, and I change all the town names. So even that way, so I don't get stuck in my head of going down that route of telling something the way that I remember it. Um, and it frees me to have one more fun, but to not stick to a narrative, because I think if I did, it could probably go even darker. And apparently people think that my books are dark. So <laughs> I don't, I think there's dark humor, but I think Arkansas too. And I don't know if this is true. You know, maybe, you know, John, like in the South, we definitely have a dark humor. Yeah. 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 Attached to everything. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. just, it's just there. And it's, it's kind of, you have awesome. to make fun of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, the intensity of the emotion of the feeling of the mm -hmm. place requires a response and it tends to be dark humor, you know, so exactly. it's a coping mechanism. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Your, your characters then like, um, you know, uh, Jane Mooney, when you, when you mentioned, um, how much do you, of yourself do you think you put into characters, main characters? I'd say, you know it's like they're not they're not me they're not based on me but they are me right because every, they're from my brain but there are a lot of there are pieces of me and pieces of people I've met in my life so if they were just me that would be super boring but I do think that my main character's are often like me and that I seem, you know, these characters seem like they're kind of just doing weird things, but there's this quietness to them. And I remember my parents or my aunts used to say, you know, still waters run deep. And so I think my characters, many of my main characters are that kind of still waters run deep person where they have lots of deep thoughts and dark thoughts um, that don't necessarily come out. Um, 
but because it's me, I have to make, and it's fiction, I have to make sure they come out. I have to make sure they have agency and I have to ensure there's a plot, which is, you know, so not fun all the time. I, I love character study. I tell people all the time, I'm like, I will take your tangents and your flashbacks because I love it. Mm. So how do you experience your characters then? Like when you're, when you're sitting down and you're putting together the book, how, how, how does Jane come to you? Is it like a voice or is it like a movie um, or something else? I think for me, I'm, I'm usually thinking about a character for a very long time, almost a year, maybe more before I actually sit down and write a character. So I do a lot of, you know, what my teachers would have called daydreaming. So <laughs> I still, and I still do that. Daydreaming has been a huge part of my life. And it turns out I could turn the career into daydreaming. Um, so I spend a ton of time. I, I, when I didn't live in the woods um, and I lived in the city, I was in Boston for a couple decades. Um, go on lots of walks and thinking things through and kind of playing through scenarios in my head. So I kind of have an idea of what I'm going to write before I even sit down to write it. So then when I am sitting down to write it, I feel like I'm truly just inhabiting my characters. And then I go into that weird trance state that a lot of writers get into where I'm done. And it's kind of like, where have I been? I just did this thing for two hours and I barely remember it. And so it's kind of an out of body experience, except you get an output at the end. Oh, so you, you don't just like come to in your car or something in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> and no, there's a body in the very, trunk. I have to be something. sitting. <laughs> that part is intentional. I'm definitely <laughs> sitting at a desk with my laptop. Hmm. Well, you just never know, right? You just wake <laughs> wake up and there's a shovel by the bed, you know. And um, <laughs> I, I I love it when you can sink into something and, and it feels mm -hmm. like you know. I, I think that's that's when the magic's happening. I, I absolutely. I definitely have writing days where that is not. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you have those days where you're like if I could just get into this oh, world, all the time, the world, leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah, and it doesn't always happen. So when it does, it's such a gift. Mm -hmm. And I think it's nice because I'm not thinking about it too much. And that really only happens with first drafts or for me, first or third drafts, truly, where I can kind of go into that state of, I don't know if it's relaxation, focus, where I'm not really thinking about it about it too much but then once I actually know what the story is like then I have to really pay attention <laughs> and be thoughtful about things like plot well do, do things then in your in your real life um affect that mood because it sounds like it's very so you 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 sit at your desk and you get really immersed in this but when that happens um or can it happen if there's something let's say really stressful or bizarre going on in life uh, or can you just turn that on and it happens or it doesn't? I have to really force it. Um, I have worked a nine to five most of my life. I've been working since I was 16, but um, I think breaking I'm part time now, but breaking out of that nine to five habit is very hard. I feel like, I'm on a self-imposed digital leash where I'm waiting for clients to get back to me or coworkers and I'm checking things. So I have to be very deliberate about blocking my time and blocking my space. But I have been really good over the years because I've had to work with a full-time job about um, being able to work pretty much anywhere. As long as I put on brown noise, I can't, I can't really listen to music when I'm writing. Um, I like to listen to music when I'm doing my daydreaming and my kind of thinking when I'm walking or working out. But when I'm sitting down to write, I typically put on brown noise and um, I can't really 
work in a cafe or something, but if I need to, I just put on a hat so I can't see people walking by. Um, but yeah, I don't have a super hard time writing in different places like Cotton Mouse. I wrote on a beach in P-Town for a week. I wrote parts of it in Cancun on a, a writing retreat I, I bought for myself because a friend had uh, worked at a hotel and got me cheap rates. And I wrote it in a living room. I just wrote it everywhere in conference rooms. Um, yeah, so I... I I'm not too precious about my process more just, I I can't have a ton of noise or visible distractions. So whatever I can do to remove those two things, it's pretty easy though, to be honest. So. Hmm. How much research do you put into it for the, um, you know, the criminal part or Mm -hmm. the detectives or the, uh, the different details in, in involved in crimes and violence? I probably don't put as much as I should. <laughs> I'll start there. Um, because my my books aren't super procedural. They're more focused on kind of the accidental criminals. Um, so I do what I need to do to feel good. And then I have someone close to me who's a former law enforcement officer. So um I'm able to run things by them and see. And then if I'm uncertain, you know, doing that research online, but I typically do more of the research, like with cotton mouths, I did way more research on meth because I was like, Oh no, it's Arkansas. I don't want the farmers to come after me. <laughs> so, and it was so funny. Cause one of my friends like he was the only one he pointed out. He said, you must have done so much research on anhydrous ammonia. And I was like, you know what? I did. Thank you. Like meth circles, the, the social hierarchy of, of a meth lab. I mm. read those case studies. I read those papers. <laughs> oh, wow. So, um, that that's crazy. You didn't actually go out to some meth houses, did you, and hang out? I mean, you didn't have to. I mean, <laughs> well, I, I I actually had someone in my family who um unfortunately was connected um with meth. And um I mean it was when I started writing this, it was very much well, when I started writing Cotton Mouse, my debut, it was pretty much when meth was really becoming a thing in the South, mainly the mom and pop when people were, um, they had their homemade labs. And so, I mean, I can still just ride down the dirt road toward my dad's house and they're burnt out meth trailers. And you see that sometimes here in the Northeast too. And I, I don't think people realize it. I mean, it's more opioids here now, but, um, it's still, it's still a bad thing, you know. It's still there. Is it is this sort of like um in your stories in both these books? Is there a subtext or some sort of point that you want readers to take away besides the entertainment? Mhm. I think if anything it's just, you know, I grew up in a south that is very different from what I see on TV or what I've read in books. And so I'm not necessarily hoping that someone will take something away, but I am showing a different side of especially Southern women. I think especially in crime fiction and Southern, well, especially in Southern fiction that the women are very much, um, I wouldn't say throw away, but they don't have, fully developed characters. And it's always irked me because, you know, growing up Southern, the women are the ones who are the, the ones you really need to watch out for. <laughs> like, like grandpas who you run to when grandma's going to beat your ass. <laughs> so like they were really tough and, you know, not sometimes I had a funny, tough grandma and I had a really tough grandma. And, you know, 
and women in my family who are very strong and you just don't want to mess with them. And I think that's missing in a lot of Southern fiction. And what's missing too is it's not just dirt poor or, you know, plantation fiction or sororities and Southern bells. There are working class women, working class men and you see that in Southern fiction, but I just inhabited a different world where I want to show the social, the societal pieces that come into play because, you know, I'm, I'm talking about generational trauma and what causes that. And a lot of that, that is housing instability and food insecurity and childhood neglect, um, some things I've experienced. So, so showing how, those pieces of a life can change your trajectory, your trajectory and can change their turning points for characters. Like if, if not for this, this character might not have had to make this choice. Um, hmm. what, what, what do you think people get wrong about the South then? What is it that, that is most common that you hear or see in other books or movies or shows that, you always kind of go, well, that's not real. That's just not how it is. What, what's the most common thing that, that irks mm. you? I don't know that people get it wrong so much as we always get the same picture. The, the cisgender white male who is struggling with something and they have, you know, their stalwart wife or girlfriend by their side um and they're figuring their stuff out or it just goes batshit crazy and they're doing weird things so you know whatever um so yeah I don't know that it's anyone getting it wrong um unless you're talking about people who write about the south who aren't from the south and then they definitely get things wrong <laughs> but it's like <laughs> no it's that you actually there is there is no target in, in, in Northwest Arkansas. I'm so sorry. Goodbye. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, but if that makes sense. Um, so yeah. And also you just, you don't have a ton of queer characters and there are queer people in the South and, and there are, you know, people of color in the South. And so whenever I'm talking about Southern fiction, I'm always, I try as much as I can to lift up those voices because they're so important. Um, and I think that's the piece I miss so much is that the, the Southern fiction that gets lifted up is oftentimes from straight white males. Um, so hmm. yeah. yeah, John might know something about that. Yeah. He's a straight white male. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the you know you know what I mean. <laughs> I do know what you mean, and I I think that I, I there's I think that outsiders and I I think sometimes people who thought they were insiders and are no longer, mm -hmm. um you know look back on a, on a place and um, I don't know if if you find this Kelly, but they reduce it or oversimplify. Mm -hmm. it. That's the thing that mm -hmm. drives me bananas. I mean, sometimes it's like you would think that the only people who live in the South or I'm um, from Appalachia, so like who lived mm -hmm. in Appalachia, what, you know, are either super poor or super rich or like, you know, it was this, exactly. And I'm like, um, most of the people I knew were middle-class folks, working class folks. And it's just a, it's, it's a sort of um, problematic outsider stereotype. And then of course we are dealing with the idea of there being, you know, queer characters or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. I was going to ask you, Kelly, if you felt like it gives you, you know, you, the, the way you write the South or your your sensibility, do you think that that has a particularly like queer point of view or is it more something else? I, I, I'm some, It's actually a question mm -hmm. I ask myself a lot. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> I think I'm all queer all the time <laughs> with my writing. I didn't used to be when I first started out. I was definitely more, uh, as you had mentioned, Al, that that um, vulnerability. That was much higher for me when I was first starting out, of course. Um, but I think 
honestly, just getting older, <laughs> you know, I've been writing for a long time. I've been trying to get published for a long time, but I've also been a woman in tech and I've had to deal with some really dumb stuff that I shouldn't have to deal with. And, um, so there's a part of me now that everything is it's not filtered through a queer voice it just is my queer voice it's how I see the world and so my characters are just unabashedly queer and so that comes through for them as well hmm well well, maybe explain to this um hick Canadian here um, what (laughs) what is southern noir or what should it be Oh, gosh. I feel like this was a question I, I get all the time, and I never know how to answer it. Um, well, what would be the difference? Like, yeah. here I am. I'm up in uh, mm-hmm. in the Great White North, and then someone goes, well, is it a Southern Noir? And it's like, well, I don't know. What is that? Mm-hmm. Like, what, what's think, different? Yeah, I think that, and you guys can give me your thoughts, too. I think for me, Noir is a nod to a certain mystery category. Whereas Southern fiction, Southern Gothic is, I think it, there's an expansion of what a crime can be, what constitutes a crime, because I think you're getting into less of the straight up murder mystery and more into kind of the degradation of society, of emotions, people's lives mentally uh, from the things they encounter in society. But I don't really know. Like noir to me is always, I always think of, you know, gumshoe detectives and that sort of thing. But, you know, in talking with Krista Faust, because this question came up, at a BoucherCon conference. And she said, you know what? Noir is black. It's dark. So it's just dark. And I was like, oh, right. That makes sense. (laughs) So. Yeah. It's really interesting. I think, you know, there's lots of schools of thought about, I I teach film some and in particularly film noir and they're like different schools of thought about what noir is. And some say it's like, like, you you know, detect a type of detective character, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, Philip Marlowe, that kind of thing. Some say it's a, a mood or feeling is sort of the mise-en-scene of the you know, whatever the, the setting or the their shadows and darkness, what that particularly is true when you think about film. But the last one I find most compelling, which is like this sort of pessimistic sensibility, like kind of, you know, faded characters that are locked in and can't quite escape, you know, mm. that stuff, which feels like that has a lot more connections to like something like the Gothic, Southern Gothic stuff. I always feel yeah. like when people say Southern noir, I think, I kind of think gothic in my head in some way, you know, not maybe in the traditional way, but. Um. Yeah. And I, I like that. And sometimes even with Southern Gothic, it reminds me too much of deep South. So I kind of like Southern noir yeah. because it, it okay. can encapsulate a lot more of the woods yeah. um, for me. Yeah. The woods. Yeah. yeah. I like that definition. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I relate more strongly with, hill people you Mm -hmm. know it's the ozarks the arkansas river valley that is far more um appalachian or appalachian i always mess it up and everybody has a different (laughs) pronunciation damn it it's it's either Um, either way it's fine and sometimes i say (laughs) (laughs) but i feel more connected with those folks because it is that almost you don't trust anyone um you're really scrappy and you're hiding out in the hills and uh, bad shit happens there. So yeah, not that bad shit doesn't happen in the Delta because wow, <laughs> don't we know it does. <laughs> so, flavor of, 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 of bad shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Hmm. Well, do you ever have difficulties getting into the head and writing, maybe conveying, uh, a character which you don't like 
like you know and you talk about the violent stepfather and then mm-hmm. having your own does it sort of hit close too close to home for you to kind of really get into that character not really i think the if i don't like a character i honestly just delete them <laughs> I, <laughs> because i think if i'm bored with this character someone else will be and um i think all my characters i really love them even the really bad ones because I love the composition of who they are and what made them who they are. And I think that's the thing I love most about fiction is, and writing is that I'd like to kind of reverse engineer a, a situation and kind of like, how do you lose your eye? <laughs> you know, and that's a kind of a nod to something. And um, I kind of, look back and I'm like how did you lose your eye kind of like talking to a character so sometimes I'll do interviews of my characters imagining them as say 80 90 years old doing an interview and at that point they don't care they're going to tell you everything or a deathbed confession and that's kind of where I I start to learn more about my characters and what they went through and so I do a ton of just background thinking about who these people are. And I think because I do so much of that, I know them as fleshed out people. Um, It's hard for me to not like them, even the bad ones, because I can say, oh, you're so bad. You're so good. You know, like Warren, the stepfather character, hate that guy, but I love him as an antagonist. Mm. How, how do you classify your your characters then and i say that because mm-hmm. with a lot of fiction writers they'll say well it's like my children it's like my family it's like mm. you know something like this do you do you have a classification or a feeling toward them i think if anything i think of them as just characters i'm very close to um because you sit with these characters for so long. And I think I'm a very slow writer and I struggle more with plot. And so I have put them through so much before you've even seen them on the page. And then before whatever they've been through, you know, what you see on the page, they've been through so much. So for me, they're just, these wild characters it's almost like you fall in love with a character with tv shows and something like people love walter white it's like we writers have that ability to fall in love with those characters the same way that fans do only we're the ones that create them so you're getting quite a bit of um good feedback on your writing on both (laughs) books. (laughs) Quite a few people say good things like it. it, um, So how does that make you feel? Or does that sort of make you more cautious about when you're writing the next book? You know, getting good feedback feels (laughs) it doesn't like if it's from family or friends, I don't trust it, which is often why I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Um, and then with my first book, it didn't get much press at all. It, you know, was just kind of sitting out there. And so I was kind of craving, like, does anyone like it? Does anyone know? So I actually did go on to Goodreads. And luckily, there were these really awesome women on there who read it and shared it with one another. And it, you know, I think that helped a lot. And then going, and to BoucherCon and meeting people who had read it helps. So that was that was really nice. And so I think that helps, you know, with with real bad things. I have a much bigger audience. And, and um it's definitely a weird feeling to be perceived by the general public. <laughs> because I just, you know, I try I ha I can't look at the reviews uh for for my current book because I I'm in the middle of developmental edits and I don't want that voice in my head. That's like, you know, you do use too much dialogue. You know what? Your plot does suck. (laughs) You know what? (laughs) This book is disgusting. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm like, excuse me, have you ever seen the trailer for Human Centipede? Because <laughs> if we want to talk about disgusting, <laughs> let's have a conversation. But um, you just don't, it's so subjective and it's it's too loud right now. So um, whenever, you know, I get gifted with someone saying something nice, it I, I, I take that to heart. Um, and I'm very grateful because I think it's, it's hard to publish. It's hard to write a book. It's hard to publish a book. It's hard to get anyone to even notice you in such a saturated market. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that my book does well enough that other queer writers like me in this genre, either Southern fiction or Southern crime fiction, queer fiction, whatever it is, will have at least a comp they can point to and say, hey, you know, here's the comp for my book and not have the troubles that so many of us have had trying to sell books with queer characters. You know, but if someone someone's giving you a bad review, you can always just tell them, look, I don't go to your job and slap the sailor's <laughs> cock out of your mouth. Um, so I don't come can't. to mind. I won't. <laughs> well, you know, but the thing is, you can always say, yeah, you're right. Uh, if someone said something's bad to me, I always go, yeah, you're exactly right. You're right. Exactly. Because actually... you think it's bad, it's bad. Well, it's bad. Yeah. You just can't read good root reads and review. I mean, I, I just don't. I, I personally don't. You can't. I, it's for yeah. readers. I, just, I do, some, I do mm-hmm. look at uh, Amazon, but I, I think it's just Goodreads is just a little... I think it's better to look at the overall picture. Like when you go look at something and you see 500 reviews and you got four out of five, that means overall people really like what you're doing. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the best, the best way to do it without getting too, too into it, you know, and start Mm -hmm. micromanaging every little word you're using, you know, because of what you heard, you know, avoid the noise completely. Now, now I want to be a really good writer and be a star okay so like so what do i gotta do <laughs> I'm, I'm working i'm asking you so how do, how do i become like kelly j ford how do i do this oh god struggle for years <laughs> cry <laughs> you didn't just make it overnight Take feedback of bad people <laughs> You didn't make it overnight. I mean, you didn't just like wake up one day. No, or... absolutely did not. No, this this took a long time. I, you know, I tell everyone I'm like t- tenacity overrides talent every time because I really do believe that people can learn how to write a book and or write a story, but it definitely takes time. Like I, I still struggle with so many pieces of it, and I know so many people who do, and I think. Um, staying humble and just knowing being able to take that feedback and going back to your work and shaping it into something better and know that it you can do better but so many people just stop and I'm just I'm not one of those people from a very young age I've been very competitive <laughs> I was the only girl who swam across the pool in <laughs> kindergarten you me know? too I was like <laughs> they, <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna be that girl. So um, yeah, anyone who tells me I can't do something, I am 100% going to try to do it. So reasonably ooh, speaking, yeah. like I'm not gonna climb mountains or anything. I'm not crazy. Oh come on! You actually want want to do? I don't know. Maybe you want to climb a mountain. Exactly. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. You know, it's just way too cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't understand. I love to watch the documentaries. Right. <laughs> That's all I you love do. to be terrified. Yeah. That's all you need. Well, who who do you go to to be terrified? Who do you go to for inspiration? And it doesn't have to be writers. It can be anything. Mm. Like, is there is there any particular thing that gives you kind of a strong feeling or surge to kind of go, yeah, reinvigorates you? Or Really just reading other good books. Um, I think for real bad things, you know, Dan Sean's ill will, God, I love that book. It was so cool. And, um, you know, murders involved and then Gillian Flynn's dark places 
was really influential for me and um gosh Shirley Jackson we have always lived in the castle so I think there's so many great great writers and um I don't feel competitive even though I'm competitive um <laughs> when I read their things I just I want I want to write as well as they do mm. Yeah, I feel thankful yeah. cool when I read someone that I love. I feel I don't feel I feel thankful for it. Like mm -hmm. there's a beautiful thing that I can read and you know perhaps aspire to, probably mm -hmm. not succeed. But you know it's just thank goodness you get to sit there and read it. You know I think that's oh I yeah. run and give them a one star and tell them they're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> No. So uh, listen, how do you, how do you like to, do you like to interact then with readers and fans or, or just people in general? And if you do, how do you do it? Like what social media platforms can people find you at or a website? Like uh, wh where do people go to find Kelly? Well, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. So I think that's where I've interacted with the most people and you get different people. I think, um, the crime community in general is pretty active on Twitter and they're the most fun writer community. I can say I've been in a few and um, God, I love them. They're so giving and they're so funny um, for writing about murder and right. some things. <laughs> so um, yeah. So I, I primarily have interacted with folks on Twitter. Like I remember, you know, it's kind of weird. I, you think it's word of mouth or something, how someone hears about you and then you meet it. Like I met someone at VoucherCon and then they're following me online or we're just talking or, you know, I think if like John knows someone, then I'm like, oh, I totally know you too because I know John and we're both writers. So we're in the same community. So I'm going to promote you. And I'm going to interact with, you know, so I think for me, it's very organic and um, just hanging out with people either in real life or online and just being myself. And I don't pretend to know much. I just cuss a lot and promote my friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my saying. Like. <laughs> well, there you have it. Now, do you have a website? I do. I am at kellyjford.com. It's pretty yeah. easy. Yeah, that's, uh, we'll have that up, of course, and and uh, so people can find it with one click and uh, maybe uh, say something nice. He should. Oh, please do. <laughs> please do. So, so what's happening next? Like, where is uh, Kelly Ford going next? Well, I'm physically go to going to BoucherCon. So I'm hoping to see a lot of folks there, even though it's still COVID. And so I'm going to have my mask on, but um, I think that'll be fine. It'll be good to be connected with the crime community again in person. Um, but for right now, I'm just trying to get my next book for Thomas and Mercer back into their hands. Um, so I'm in developmental edits for my third book tentatively titled the hunt now that's part of it that that's an amazon publishing um is mm. that correct yes yes how, how do you how do you like that i guess that's hard to say on mm -hmm. air isn't it but how do you how do you <laughs> <laughs> well no but how does it is it been is it a is it a great experience overall the Thomas and Mercer and the Amazon publishing experience has been really wonderful. Um, no lies found. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> just from the moment that, you know, they even heard about me, there was enthusiasm because many of them had read Cotton Mouse or knew about Cotton Mouse. And so that was cool um, to have someone reading your stuff on submission and they know about your first book. Um but they've been really great. And because I am in technology, it's a good fit because they have schedules and they have goals and deadlines and they have really detailed information to provide you in terms of what to expect, um, what to look for, that sort of thing. And they've been super supportive and, you know, 
my publicist there has gotten me into a lot of hands. So they've been really great. A uh, bunch of really wonderful people working over there. And publishing a lot of marginalized voices. I, might yeah, I was add. about to ask that question. Do you feel that? Yeah. yeah I'm starting to sense that from them, which is cool. Very cool. Yeah. And it's really weird because you're like, that doesn't make any sense because it's all about metrics and data and that sort of thing. But I do think that they're taking some chances on writers that a lot of traditional publishers won't take chances on because we, you put us in a P and L and we're coming up negative. Hmm. Perception wise. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, well, hopefully things will get a little bit better with main publishers, yeah. you know, but can't mm -hmm. hold your breath, you know. How was the pandemic? Was the pandemic, like, difficult on you in the writing area? Um, I don't think so. I mean, it was difficult for everyone, obviously. Right. Um, but I, I'm very privileged. I work in IT, so I was able to work remotely Um and I work for a really wonderful company and I have space, I have time. And so I was able to really focus as much as I could, but I was also on a deadline. So I, I feel like I'm always on a deadline. So sometimes the world seems to go on around me and then I kind of lift my head and I'm like, Oh my God, how long have I just been inside the house and not left, <laughs> which is a lot. <laughs> Turns out about a week. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, <laughs> just remember to change your underwear. That's yep. all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, every day. <laughs> Nobody sees me. Nobody cares, but you know, I have some, I have some semblance of civility, <laughs> <laughs> some civilization. <laughs> Um, yes yeah standards you know but well it's it's really interesting talking to you I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and uh of course now the book we're talking about is real bad things and the guest is the author kelly j ford so uh thanks for coming on thank you so much this was a really good time i appreciate it thank you kelly You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.